Tucker Carlson expresses alarm over the burning of churches and the persecution of Christians, emphasizing the peaceful nature of the Christian community. He calls attention to the disturbing trend of targeting a group known for its pacifist teachings and advocates for understanding the motivations behind such actions. The focus is on the need for societal awareness and discernment when faced with issues like church burnings and persecution based on religious beliefs. Don't miss. What is Tucker Carlson's stance on the treatment of Christians in society? How does Carlson perceive the connection between burning churches and being on the wrong side? What are the key criticisms Tucker Carlson raises regarding the modern left and their approach to public safety? The last thing I'll say, which also may be controversial because it sounds like a parochial concern or some sort of, you know, weird religious thing or something, and it's not. But take a look at what they're doing to your Christians. Take a look at what they're doing to your Christians. Christians facing adversity or persecution evoke deep empathy and a sincere desire to protect the rights and welfare of religious groups. And I say this for a couple of, I am a Christian, but that's not why I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this because there's, there's kind of no more inoffensive and peaceful group in the world than the Christians. There is kind of no more inoffensive and peaceful group in the world than the Christians. To grasp Christians' essence, it's vital to recognize their inherent tranquility, promoting empathy towards them, and proactively protecting peaceful religious communities. That there is it. The religion tells them, commands them to turn the other cheek and to put the concerns of others above their own concerns. The religion tells them, commands them to turn the other cheek and to put the concerns of others above their own concerns. Encourage a deep comprehension and rally backing for those who follow Christian beliefs, grounded in forgiveness and selflessness principles. This aligns with common values of empathy and ethical duty. So if you have a problem with those precepts, explain it to me. Speak slowly so I can understand. I think every person in this room, regardless of your faith, can agree, yeah, I'm for that. I wish I was more like that. That's good. Yeah, I think every person in this room, regardless of your faith, can agree. Yeah, I'm for that. I wish I was more like that. That's good. Amidst various viewpoints, there's a prevailing belief in the irresistible appeal of Christian values, the creation of a common moral foundation, and the importance attached to shared ethical principles. We need more of those people in society. Serve others for the sake of service. People who pray for their enemies. Who does that? Who would pray for an enemy? No one, except the Christians to serve others for the sake of service, people who pray for their enemies. Who does that? Who would pray for an enemy? No one except the Christians, and they do. They're commanded to. Christian compassion is distinguished by the selfless gesture of praying for adversaries. This act originates from a deep conviction in the moral superiority of Christian ideals and the inherent worth of showing empathy, even to those seen as foes. And they do. They're commanded to. So if you're hassling that group, maybe you've got another agenda that we should be concerned about, even if we're not in that group. If we burn 90 of their churches to the ground, and the prime minister and his little weird buddies are endorsing that, burning churches, if you're on the side of burning churches, let me just say, I don't need any other facts of the case, you're on the wrong side. If you're on the side of burning churches, let me just say, I don't need any other facts of the case. You're on the wrong side. The statement strongly condemns the act of burning a church, explicitly criticizing those who support such actions. It emphasizes a clear moral position and the importance of respecting sacred spaces, firmly opposing any violence against religious institutions. Amen. Amen, brother. If you're throwing preachers in prison, for preaching the Christian... Throwing preachers in prison for preaching the Christian gospel, preachers, in light of legal consequences, navigate the intricate landscape of practicing and spreading faith, advocating for religious freedom, and opposing perceived injustices against the Christian faith. Gospel, not for hurting anyone, not for making pipe bombs, not for trying to castrate other people's children, not for importing millions of people into your country who are not going to have work. Just for the crime of preaching the Christian gospel, you go to jail. Just for the crime of preaching the Christian gospel, you go to jail. The concept emerges that imprisoning people solely for expressing and spreading their Christian beliefs is unfair. This concern worries religious individuals who seek to protect their freedom and maintain their religious liberties. 
At the same time, when they're encouraging your kids to do drugs, and not just fentanyl, but weed, don't raise your hand if you have a 15-year-old son. But come up to me after and tell me what you think of legalized weed. For real. And, and if you have a 15-year-old son, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They did that to you and to your son on purpose. And so in a country like that, in a world like that, if you think that preaching the gospel is so dangerous that the people who do it need to be in prison in shackles, you're serving someone other than the people of Canada. If you think that preaching the gospel is so dangerous that the people who do it need to be in prison in shackles, you're serving someone other than the people of Canada. The Canadian public is questioning the implications of labeling the spread of religious teachings as dangerous, which contradicts the country's democratic principles and commitment to free speed. If you know what I mean. Amen. Amen. That's really scary. If you know what I mean, that's really scary. The public is uneasy, questioning the essence of religious freedom. Concerns echo widely, reflecting worries about potential infringement on personal rights and cherished values. And I don't care how much they dress it up in the passive-aggressive, self-help language of the modern left. Well, it's really about public safety. Every time I turn on your freaking television shows, everything's about public safety, which is a euphemism for hard-edged fascism, actually. Everything's about public safety which is a euphemism for hard-edged fascism, actually. We object to the application of public safety, fearing it may become authoritarian. Concerns arise about infringing personal freedom and skepticism grows about expanding government power. And frankly, I'm a little bit more comfortable with the old-fashioned variety. Where guys in tight uniforms goose step through your time, because at least you know who you're fighting. I'm a little bit more comfortable with the old-fashioned variety. Where guys in tight uniforms goose step through your town, because at least you know who you're fighting. Canadians are expressing unease with what they see as modern authoritarian tendencies and a longing for clarity in more traditional forms of oppression. They value transparency and seek a comprehensive understanding of potential threats, often using irony to convey their concerns. Tucker Carlson's remarks serve as a cautionary message, urging the public to consider the implications of supporting actions like burning churches or persecuting Christians. The emphasis is on fostering a society that respects diverse beliefs and practices, rather than endorsing hostility or violence against any particular group. The public is encouraged to engage in thoughtful discussions about religious freedom, tolerance, and the potential consequences of targeting peaceful communities. In emphasizing moral clarity, Tucker Carlson underscores the notion that endangering a church places individuals on the wrong side. This perspective significantly impacts public empathy and the stances of those who uphold distinct moral boundaries. Tucker Carlson exhibits a genuine concern for Christians, drawing attention to the principle of turning the other cheek rooted in their peaceful nature. Depicting a religious group as fundamentally peace-loving holds sway over public sentiment and perception. But suspicion arises as Carlson questions individuals harassing Christians, delving into the potential consequences of framing concealed intentions, fears, and concerns especially those linked to being perceived as a threat to religious freedom with hidden agendas, simultaneously addressing church arson and raising apprehensions about legalized cannabis, Tucker Carlson capitalizes on the fear surrounding social values and priorities. He hints at impending societal shifts targeting innocent religious practices, expressing worry about preachers facing imprisonment for spreading the Christian gospel. Carlson deems it an assault on freedom of expression and religious practices. This approach delves into the anxiety tied to threats against fundamental freedoms, probing how these concerns resonate with public values. The emotional impact of Carlson's rhetoric extends to critiquing the modern left's emphasis on public safety, labeling it a euphemism for stringent fascism. Fear surrounds potential violations of individual freedoms in the name of public safety. Carlson leans towards a preference for traditionalist values, expressing discomfort with ideologies shrouded in secrecy. He favors transparency in ideological conflicts and confronts perceived concealed authoritarianism head-on. What do you think? Tucker Carlson speaks out on the persistent decline of individual rights in Canada, emphasizing the universality of inherent human rights regardless of political leadership. He highlights concerns about restrictions on self-defense and freedom of expression, attributing these limitations to a narrative of public safety. 
Additionally, Carlson raises questions about media influence, specifically how state subsidies impact journalistic independence, and challenges the narrative of societal issues being solely addressed through the lens of political correctness. Don't miss, how does Tucker Carlson view the relationship between individual rights and the political landscape in Canada? What concerns does he raise regarding the media and its influence on public perception? In what ways does Carlson address the impact of demographic changes on voting power in Canada? It doesn't matter who's in the prime minister's office. Your rights remain the same because you were born with them because you are not a slave, you're a human being. And you have inherent dignity because God made you. Because you are not a slave, you're a human being. And you have inherent dignity because God made you. The unique essence of every individual shaped by divine influence. It emphasizes fundamental beliefs about personal value, individual dignity, and the concept of inherent entitlements. That's just a fact. And if they're taking those rights away piecemeal and doing so in the name of public safety, even as they make the public sphere much more dangerous, which they have, in case you haven't noticed, Canada has a lot more violent crime now than it did 20 years ago. Have you noticed? Of course you have. You live here. And if they're telling you you can't defend yourself against that crime, we're going to disarm you. You can't protect your life or your family. You can't defend yourself against that crime. We're going to disarm you. You can't protect your life or your family. The importance of recognizing the concerns of individuals facing potential disarmament. It highlights the significance of self-defense rights, individual accountability, and the sacredness of familial protection. And you're like, oh yeah, it's for the public safety. It's just not, not a big deal. These are weapons of war. No, they're weapons of self-defense, which you need and deserve as a free person, not a slave. Which you need and deserve as a free person, not a slave. The paradoxical stance between conservative values emphasizing self-reliance and the right to bear arms for self-defense, contrasting with the vulnerability of individuals lacking such means, particularly those in bondage. And then they're telling you, you can't complain about it. And then they're subsidizing the media to the point where all of your big media outlets, which are disgusting, are state media because they're taking state cash. Subsidizing the media to the point where all of your big media outlets are state media because they're taking state cash. The challenge of maintaining unbiased media while considering state subsidies. It highlights the delicate balance between media independence and objectivity in a democratic society. Do you watch CBC? I do, occasionally. I can turn in any hour of the day and I will learn that I am racist for driving an SUV and not being trans. That's, that's the whole schedule of CBC programming. But interpret that, that's not woke. Oh, it's woke. I hate the woke crap. It doesn't mean anything. They hate you. But interpret that, that's not woke. Oh, it's woke. I hate the woke crap. It doesn't mean anything. They hate you. Strongly rejects the wokeness ideology, challenging its underlying narratives. It expresses contempt for a particular individual, empathy for those unfairly targeted, and disgust towards ideological imbalances. That's what they're saying. They're saying that you are bad. That's exactly what they're saying. Don't lie to yourself. That's, what, that's all I'm saying. And we are very delusional in the United States because we're so distracted by stuff and electronic devices and the promise of next day delivery from Amazon of brightly colored plastic crap made in China that we tend to be slow to figure out what's going on. But Canada has a different restraint, which is a cultural one. It's an Anglo, specific Anglo cultural one, which is just like, I don't want to deal with that. That's too uncomfortable. But in your heart, anyway, even if you voice it to no one but yourself, know what the message is. And the message is, you are bad. In your heart, anyway, even if you voice it to no one but yourself, know what the message is, and the message is, and the message is, you are bad. Social messages carry emotional weight, often leading people to feel morally judged or labeled negatively. This emotional response is compounded by the psychological strain of perceiving criticism from society. I mean, I'm gonna say the most controversial thing ever. I watched when Montreal was cleansed of its Anglo legacy. I watched when Montreal was cleansed of its Anglo legacy to counter the perceived loss of British heritage in Montreal, show genuine empathy, foster a lasting interest in cultural legacy, historical identity, and traditional customs, acknowledge the significant impact of cultural changes, emphasizing the need to embrace change while still valuing our foundational roots. And I'm not anti-French, just, just for the record, at all. 
And I'm not anti-French, just for the record, at all. The lack of hostility towards the French, highlighting how it adheres to democratic ideals of fairness and personal judgment. It emphasizes the importance of distinguishing criticism of a particular policy from general animosity towards the entire group. But I am Anglo, and I had friends in Montreal. And in the span of a generation, like, that's all gone. They were forced out. They were forced out. Understanding the empathetic perspective of people who strongly desire to explore beyond their homes and protect themselves from the impacts of policies on their personal lives, freedoms, and choices of residence is crucial. And they're like, okay, I guess we'll go to Ontario. What? My grandfather built this city. I'm not going anywhere. My grandfather built this city. I'm not going anywhere. The focus lies on embracing your roots and committing to preserving your family's influence within the community. This involves acknowledging familial heritage, taking personal responsibility, and finding fulfillment through contributing individually. How about that? That never occurred to anyone. Because no one could say out loud what was actually happening. This was a series of acts of hostility aimed at you because of things that you didn't choose, like how you were born. And once you will keep allowing that, you have no future, okay? So if they're limiting your freedom to say what you think, which is a freedom of conscience, the most basic of all freedom. If they're limiting your freedom to say what you think, which is the freedom of conscience, the most basic of all freedom, the crucial importance of freedom of conscience as a fundamental right. It expresses sincere empathy for those who are unable to freely express their thoughts. It emphasizes the democratic principle of valuing individual freedom and unrestricted speech. Your freedom to defend yourself and your family against bodily harm, which has got to be a twin to the first one. If they're taking away your voting power by changing the population of your country. If they're taking away your voting power by changing the population of your country, raises concerns about the threat to voting rights due to changes in population dynamics. It emphasizes the importance of protecting democratic processes, maintaining the integrity of democratic institutions, and ensuring fair representation for everyone. Which they are doing, and no one wants to talk about that. Canada has the highest immigration rate in the world per capita. And shut up, racist! That's not racist. I don't care if they're coming from New Zealand. I don't care if you're taking the population of Stockholm and moving them to Canada. If you change the population of the country, you change the country. If you change the population of the country, you change the country. Preserving a nation's cultural and historical identity is closely tied to maintaining cultural continuity and national identity, even amidst significant demographic changes. And you dilute the voting power of the people who are vested in that country, the people who are born there, who have lived there long term, who understand the history and the culture of the country, who are bought in. And all of a sudden, their vote means much less. It's math. You guys do that. Math. Tucker Carlson's message revolves around the importance of safeguarding fundamental rights, such as freedom of speech and the right to self-defense. He urges the public to critically assess the impact of policy changes on their daily lives and emphasizes the significance of maintaining cultural identity and voting power. The call is for increased awareness and engagement to protect individual freedoms and to resist narratives that may contribute to the erosion of a nation's values. In his exploration of inherent rights and dignity, Tucker Carlson contends that these rights transcend the jurisdiction of political leaders in public office. He defines them as fundamental aspects of human existence, emphasizing the psychological impact of perceiving one's rights as intrinsic and impervious to external influences. The juxtaposition arises when anxiety stems from narratives advocating disarmament for public safety, accompanied by a surge in violent crime rates and limitations on self-defense. This combination triggers feelings of vulnerability and fear, influencing the perception of personal safety. A critical examination is directed towards media framing, particularly the CBC, deemed as state-owned with government subsidies. This critique identifies mainstream media as biased and notes a woke culture, which, as Tucker Carlson asserts, labels individuals as inherently bad based on their actions and beliefs. Adding to this, Tucker Carlson delves into the Canadian concept of cultural restraint, suggesting an unspoken hostility towards specific cultural groups. This subtle animosity affects the psychological consequences and cultural identity, suppressing discussions on sensitive issues. The discourse extends to the impact of demographic changes through immigration and the potential dilution of voting rights.
individuals possessing their unique cultural identity and voting influence grapple with fear and population movement linked to changing demographics. In Tucker Carlson's perspective, this is crucial to freedom, addressing the context of conscience and the significance of freedom of expression, particularly the fear of losing one's self-identity, personal values, and the ability to express opinions freely is highlighted. Concerns are voiced about the mathematical aspects of demographic changes influencing voting rights. The way individuals navigate the idea that shifting population composition directly impacts political representation is a focal point, raising questions about the future. The narrative intertwines the intricate dynamics of demographics, politics, and personal freedom in a thought-provoking exploration led by Tucker Carlson. What do you think? I promote myself and my videos. Hello, I'm Bong Sim, a Canadian resident of Asian descent. During the day, I work as a professional counselor, and at night, I do Uber food delivery. Instead of speaking in my videos, I prefer to express myself through writing. In today's world, speaking the truth can have serious consequences, both for my professional life and personal well-being. That's why I'm choosing to pen down my thoughts and using a platform to share them on my behalf. Some people find my videos uninteresting, too strict, and they even criticize the appearance of the individuals featured, including their tiredness, Asian, or perceived flaws. I understand these concerns, but I genuinely believe in the purpose behind creating these videos. Unfortunately, recent Canadian legislation has resulted in the censorship of free speech and online content. And although Google hasn't explicitly admitted their involvement, I suspect they play a part in it. Despite my efforts to monetize my content on YouTube, I haven't been able to earn any income from it. I've tried three times, and all my attempts were rejected. They turned me down for reasons like lacking creativity, not having a recognizable face, or not having a distinct voice. Nevertheless, I've made several adjustments to my videos, hoping to overcome these challenges. If you share my belief and support what I'm doing, I would genuinely appreciate your backing.